Okay, I think we'll start. Um, welcome everyone to our webinar on unschooling and in particular brain development stages. Okay, so this is me, <laughs> only I have a bit more darker hair right now. Um, I am a certified Canadian family life educator and I am certified in the growing brain as well as the brain story. So tonight I hope to shed a bit of light on um, how brain development actually fits with learning stages. I've written a few books on parenting. One is on discipline without any punishment at all. The other one is on how to handle our anger and our children's anger before we actually get to that point of discipline. And the latest one is attachment learning tips. And it's no theory, no opinions, just a whole bunch of solutions for common problems. They've been translated, yay. And my latest one is unschooling to university. And that's followed 30 of my kids' friends um, or my friends' kids that unschooled anywhere from three years to 12 years and still applied to the post-secondary institution of their choice and were accepted, all 30 kids. And one third were in STEM careers, one third in arts careers, and one third in humanities. And as of now, about 22 of the 30 have graduated. So there you go, unschooling works. <laughs> you can read about it in the book, Unschooling to University. Here's an example of whether they went to preschool, how many years they unschooled, what age they seem to own their own education, did they go for a diploma, how did they get into post-secondary, whether they had scholarships, what discipline they were in, what institution they applied for, and what certificate they got. So you can get all that in the book. So um, I'm just going to cover a few things tonight. Um, we're probably all familiar with unschooling, but sometimes we're not. But um, there's so much to talk about in unschooling, but tonight we're just going to focus on brain development and learning. Um, I often ask people what the question is, what do children bring to school and when do they lose it? <laughs> um, you look at a little five-year-old and they are just amazingly curious and they have all these characteristics. But at what age and what stage in their education do they lose a lot of these things, especially self-confidence or motivation or leadership? Sometimes they never even get there. And what happens to engagement between age five and 15 when they start out as little kindergartners and at 15, maybe they're not really into school. <laughs> but we all know if we've been unschooling a while that there are many ways that kids learn. School is one of the ways, but not the only way. There are many other places. So basically there's um, three ways to get an education. They're school controlled. And let's just say that education is no longer defined as where it takes place. It's defined as who controls it. So in school, obviously, the government and schools control everything. In home education, the parent controls everything, <laughs> or most everything. And in unschooling, the learner controls everything. So it's like a buffet and a child sitting next to the buffet with an empty plate. And instead of the school deciding what goes on the plate and how much, or the parent, it's the child who decides. So it's kind of defined by a philosophy and lifestyle of educational freedom in which a child's natural curiosity and motivation, nurtured in a rich and stimulating environment, will lead the child to learn what he or she needs to know in the time frame he or she needs it. Okay, great. So in a school, unschooling is called self-directed education. Just so you know that. Okay, let's look at brain development and learning. So babies are born with a hundred billion of these brain cells called neurons. In the neurons, there's axons, those big thick ends, and there's dendrites at 
this end. And in the middle is the, um, the body, the body of it. And that's where a thickened coating um, protects a lot of the nerve impulses. And that coating thickens in the teen and emerging adult years, as well as becoming more white matter over gray matter. Now, how these neurons grow or make connections in the brain, which is a good thing, is that these dendrites reach out to axons and they send a neurotransmitter over the gap between it. And that neurotransmitter is kind of a response to stimulus. So when a learner learns something, whoa, you could just see that neurotransmitter go across that pathway. <laughs> and the more they learn and use it on a regular daily basis, the stronger the pathway gets. Absolutely. So these little strings are the pathways and they get stronger and stronger and stronger the more we reinforce learning and concepts. That's why you have to tell a two-year-old, no, we don't pull the dog's tail. Here, touch gently. And you have to say it over and over again so that pathway reinforces. So one day when maybe that toddler is five, they'll remember it. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so um, back in the 90s, we thought that brains go through stages of development. And this is from Jean Piaget. And in a way, it does. It's still quite similar to what we know. For example, nowadays we know that this age from three to six is a big leap in self-control and um, executive function. And this plateaus, but this stage is another big leap in self-control and executive function. And that's pretty well what the research says today. Here's the brain connections. So at birth, a child obviously doesn't have much experience other than floating around, swimming in a nice warm environment. But as soon as they emerge from the birth canal, they start experiencing through their five senses, their eyes, their ears, their mouth, their nose, and <laughs> that is when those brains start firing connections. And this goes on till about age seven when children start pruning connections that are not used often and strengthening those connections that they are used often. So for example, if a child starts French immersion or French in grade, uh, grade one, and by grade three, they leave it, they will not remember any French by age 15. It's pruned. Now, children develop in four areas, physical, cognitive, social, emotional. And let's go through the stages. So as babies, they, they don't have much higher order thinking. And the most developed part of their brain is around the brain stem. So brains develop from the bottom on up and from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. So if we start at the bottom near the brain stem, most babies just experience sensory input. For example, they get cold or they're hungry or they're scared and their output is they cry <laughs> and that's it. Input, output. They're not thinking about how they can manipulate parents to bring them back into their bed. Those are higher order thinking skills. Um, and the job of the infant is to build attachment to an attachment person and trust. Okay, next is six to 18 months. This bottom part of the brain is very much exploring. And if you look at Piaget scale, that's when they are curious, they're sensory motor, they want to know and touch and feel things. So they really explore with all their by senses, their nose, their mouth, their tongue, their ears, their touch. They have to touch everything. Um, so learning here is mostly through just embracing whatever is in front of them with their five senses. They have no idea of danger. They have no idea of cautions. 
they need a lot of supervision. <laughs> now, from six months, um, from 18 months to three years. Again, this middle part of the brain, the hippocampus, the amygdala, is the feeling part of the brain. And that's particularly sensitive right here. So toddlers get very big emotions. Sometimes they don't know what to do with them or how to self-control or manage them. So they need an adult's help in self-regulating who they are. So from zero to three, they have very, very little self-control and executive function. They rely most on an adult to tell them what to do and keep them safe even though they move fast. <laughs> That's what they do. These are some common um, characteristics of ages 18 months to three years. I think all of them look like they're self-explanatory. I think the big one here is they don't think logically not like it. They don't have logic thinking until about age five or six. So if you're doing logical consequences, they're somewhat wasted on those poor kids. <laughs> Just saying. Okay, so again, they hear, they explore their whole environment through their five senses, which is why we want to limit screen time because screen time only touches two senses, hearing and seeing. They can't, unlike Play-Doh or paint or Legos, they can't touch it, they can't smell it, they can't taste it. And they need their five senses involved in that. Okay, next is three to five years. Now this is a big leap in executive function, which is more the back of the brain here. And they're starting to do a lot of thinking and questions. This 40 means that if you ask a child under age six to do something, 40% of the time they'll do it, which means that 60% of the time they can't. And that's normal development. That is not a discipline issue. And that's what we say is that parents need to adjust their expectations that under age six, you have to repeat things a lot to kids for them to learn. And it's okay to to um, hope that they will listen to you, but it's also okay to know maybe they're not there yet. They're still developing that skill of self-control, which is putting your, their needs on hold to meet your needs. Here's some common um, characteristics of this age. They ask a lot of questions. They learn how people use their power. 60% of the time they don't listen. <laughs> okay. And here is a really good slide to show you the executive development, executive function development. So again, from birth to age three, very little. Need a lot of supervision and child proofing. From age three to six, very much developing. But this is why Grade one does not begin until age six because kids don't have self-control to sit in circle time. And a lot of preschools expect that, which is an unrealistic expectation of development of what we know right now. So expecting kids to sit still or concentrate or do math worksheets is very much out of line with what we know of the development of executive function. From age six to 13 is somewhat plateaus right there, okay? Um, memory really kicks in in about the teen years. So um, a lot of kids don't remember, even as adults, we don't remember what we studied in elementary school. We may remember some things in junior high and high school, but before age 12, not a lot. My own experience is my kids hardly remember any of the travel we did before age 12. They don't remember where we went, who we, who we stayed with, who their childhood friends were, any homeschooling activity went, we went to, any experiments we did was all for nothing. 
<laughs> I could have plunked them in front of a screen and let them watch YouTube for 12 years. Now, that's not to say that those experiences did not um, grow their brains and develop those connections, because they did. What I'm saying is, if we have the expectation that we open up kids' brains, pour everything in, zip them up, check off the boxes of what we covered, you're not, they're not going to remember those things unless they're used on a daily basis. The brain is use it or lose it. So let's say, I know a topic in Alberta in grade eight is rocks and minerals. So let's say you do a whole unit on rocks and minerals and the kids um, liked it and you were done and then two years later you ask them what they know about rocks and minerals and they don't remember a thing right that's pretty normal brain development unless they work in a field of rocks and minerals and they use it every day even in the teen years i found that interesting um my 17 year old all three of them did math higher level math and two years later they were at university and I asked them to help out their brother with his math and they couldn't remember much of what they did because it was an online course. It was not interactive or interesting. It was just information in, pass the test, gone, gone. <laughs> so not what I would consider true learning. Um, just so you know, executive function is about four components. It's about working memory, so the ability to hold two or three or four more instructions in their head like a game of chess you have to remember which way each player moves it is about um obviously self-control so taking turns in chess it's about planning ahead so plan b if your opponent takes your queen what are you going to do then and it's about Focus. Can you focus and filter out distractions and concentrate on that game? So as you can see, if, if, if I ask you if a three-year-old can play chess, probably not so much because they don't have those four components. But a seven-year-old can play chess <laughs> pretty well. <laughs> so for under age six, um, most children use their five senses. They build layers of knowledge that is experiential. So they need hands-on experiences. Now, school-agers, six to 12. This is the part of the brain, the upper part, where that is developing the most. Now they're thinking logically, very concrete though. It still has to be something in their environment and experience. And it has to be tangible, something they can see, touch, hear, taste. They're not abstract yet. So if you look at most provincial curriculums from grades one to six, most of the topics are what a child would encounter anyways in unschooling. In Alberta, I'll just run you off the topics. We study rocks and minerals, magnets, flight, wetlands, small crawling animals. In social studies, we study family, community, life around Alberta, the coal mines, um, and our, um, our Indigenous history. And then in math, we study adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. And in English, it's all stories. Kids learn to read, read a bit more interesting stories. So all of those things, kids will come across naturally if you just let their curiosity loose. Absolutely loose. They, and I was quite surprised to find that too. When I um, recorded things my kids did, a lot of things very much paralleled our provincial curriculum. Maybe not in the same sequence. It's not to say that they studied magnets or were interested in magnets in, at age eight or grade three, but they, they did at some point in time before the teen years decide to play and learn with magnets. So 
So just to assure you that um, educators have known this for centuries, that not centuries, but decades, that children do learn at this age through um, things in their daily life. And they, that's what they structure the curriculum around. These are some common attributes of teen school-agers. Okay. But also in this age, children still like to play. They still love to play Lego. They still like to paint and do draw and do a lot of hands-on things. Um, about age 13 is when kids tend to drop sports, arts, music. If they're not really good at something, they're not going to want to continue, and that's a common age they drop it. But until then, they're still, the best way to learn is hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, tasting. Maybe not so much putting things in their mouths like the young ones, but more talking. So um, they love to talk and talk and ex tell parents things and have discussions and just talk. <laughs> so rather than use workbooks and textbooks, try and use things in their daily life like Lego, video games, lots of hands-on experience. Okay, um, we found that too. Um, in math especially, we found that from ages until about age 14, all my kids learned these things through play. It was just amazing how they learned it through play, not in a workbook, but through cooking, through purchasing, through selling, lots of ways. And more things. Things like Roman numerals, they learned by reading asterisks and obelisk, reading graphs and pie charts through um, a lot of their uh, magazines, Chirp, um slides turns rolls and flips they did that mostly on the trampoline <laughs> ordered pairs and coordinates through playing battleships so lots and lots of ways then about age 13 when kids hit puberty that's when their prefrontal cortex really takes off 13 to 25 that's when they're starting to think abstractly and theoretically that is when, in junior high, they get algebra and trigonometry and things that are not readily in their environment or tangible, but concepts they can know about without seeing. So this is when kids can understand things like spiritual, um, spiritual philosophies, religion, um, and concepts in people's theories. This was a great thing. This was in um, university, I think a museum in Australia, but this is empty glass squares and this is water. And as you turn this, you get to see how the water fills the other two squares. Really three-dimensional, hands-on explanation of um, Pythagoras' theorem. So I thought that was amazing. If we had more things like that. Science centers are so good to learn things. Okay. And then teenagers, 13 to 19 years, this is the prefrontal cortex, this is where they're starting to think a lot, but you know that middle part of the brain is, is especially sensitive again, where they're feeling strong, big emotions, again, as anyone with a teenager knows. Um, <laughs> these are some common characteristics of teenagers, early teenagers, later teenagers. So this searching for identity is happens in, a, we have anecdotal evidence of this, that around age 17, when teenagers' friends are going off to college or wherever, a lot of them decide what they want to do for life's career. And that's a time when they might want to settle down and do some more formal studies for um, post-secondary admittance. It's a time where they're willing to put in a few of the hoops or take the exams or study for the exams and be on their way. But a lot aren't either. 
Now, teenagers are ready for more paperwork. Um, they have their five senses, it's built layers of knowledge, so now they have the experiential learning to build what they know on. But, as I know with adult education, anybody appreciates more three-dimensional learning. <laughs> experiential anything people can see hear touch smell and talk about not so much taste anymore but sometimes <laughs> they prefer it and then the last stage is 19 to 25 years where the myelin sheath is thickening around the neurons um, and it's the last stage of development which is really really good learners can think more critically have more decision making abilities and just generally make better decisions for themselves closer to 25. Okay so um, and through all this kids need adults. I think um, kids need adults to facilitate their learning, get them resources they can't get themselves. Um, they're also really good for um, spurring on curiosity, modeling lifelong learning. How about sharing about caring, um, relationships and attachments? Um, Gordon Neufeld says that strong attachments are not something children should grow out of. And we've seen that in the home education community is that children do have very strong attachments with their family that have not been um, socialized out of them by an institutional school. Creativity. <laughs> Kids who are encouraged to make mistakes um, tend to have a healthier self-esteem and to take more risks and that spurs creativity. Competencies are things they learn all along. So in Alberta, kids could unschool from grade ones to grade 11. Um, in grade 12, they can write diploma exams, which are just based on grade 12 courses. So they may be willing to stop and actually um, study those courses to pass the diploma exams and go on to wherever they want to go on to. Um, in provinces that do not have final year exams, um, kids can study and write the SATs and those can count too for for getting into post-secondaries. Um, it's a good time for kids to learn about finances, child development, cooking, and coding, things that are not in at least Alberta's provincial curriculum. Um, kids learn contact, so when they have a facilitator around, it helps them to connect the dots between isolated pieces of information. One example is my kids watched Disney's Parent Trap, which was brought out in 1961. And in the movie, the 14 year old twins were spanked. And <laughs> my kids turned to me and said, what? <laughs> so I had to explain the, you know, what, what happened in 1961. That was pretty normal. <laughs> and conversations and people skills. Um, schools tend to focus on reading and writing because they just don't have time to listen and allow kids to speak. So we can do that at home. And community, there's so many things to do in the community with resources, apprenticeships, coaching, um, that kids can get out there and experience a more diverse um, culture and more diverse people out there. And it's like a field trip every day, so much fun. So at this point, I'm not gonna really talk about this, but um, do we have any questions? Okay, we do have a question. Um, how does this work? Hmm. Hi, Jennifer, do you wanna talk? Hey, Judy, I do, I do. I, you know, I, I'm so grateful for this, this presentation and for 
the Facebook group that you have. I'm learning a ton. Um, oh, you, you mentioned something earlier that you said at certain age, kids will grow out of doing things they don't like. What age was that? Uh, well into the teen years. Um, for some kids, you know, it also depends on the temperament too, but for some kids, you know, you can get that around age 13. Um, like I, we found among our kids and friends, that kids become much more cooperative with chores in the teen years around age 13. But academically, they weren't really willing to put the effort into online courses till about age 15, 16, sometimes 17 or later. Got it. Yeah. So depends on the child. Um, but generally the motivation starts kicking in around age 17 when, you know, they think, okay, well, I do have to get a job. I need to, you know, support myself. I want to do something. And then they may come to you and say, well, what's the pathway if I want to be a doctor or um, what's, how do I get into school for psychology or how do I become a roofer? And that's where you can sit down and start to explore options and explain to them, you know, this and this and this might be required. And are you willing to do that? And then start really slow. I, I would suggest one course rather than sign them up for five. <laughs> right. You don't want to overwhelm them. And then, uh, yeah, and then they do well, they succeed, they feel good, they want to do more. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Have you ever, um, another question, have you ever used the Your Baby Can Learn program? No, no, never. Do you know about it? No. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's something that you, that you can start by the age of three months and it's like a 20 minute video they watch that learn it teaches them to wave and clap and yeah. colors and animals and stuff and then you have books that you go through oh. um, that match what they learned on the tv yeah so i just you know i'm following the montessori curriculum which you know doesn't promote that at all yeah but uh my friends are doing this so i you know i felt like oh my god i, I can't miss out on something so I'm trying it, but I was just wondering what your experience was, because um, so far we're on work week three, and all he knows is dog. <laughs> okay, well, um, I used to teach um, for Alberta Health Services, and I'm still using their recommendations as well as brain, the growing brain is that no screen time under age two. Um, I think the most important stuff is between adult and baby. So mm -hmm. that serve and return response. So when you make goo goo eyes or you um, teach them sign language, that is what builds those connections more so than screens. Mm -hmm. uh, because they really latch on to your eyes and facial expressions, and they don't get that on a screen. Even Dora can't do that. So, <laughs> yeah. But that's, I mean, that's not to say if you use screen time um, and you interact with your child a lot, that is good, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. Yeah. So don't worry. Um, in Alberta Health, they always say kids do not need special toys or programs to learn. Yeah, most of and, and that's what Montessori says too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not what all those products out there who want to market it to parents <laughs> no. money say. You know, but, <laughs> but that's not what the research shows. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for confirming that. Okay. Anybody else? I can. Uh, you can write or. Or I can unmute you. So um, maybe I'll just run through the conclusion while people write. Can play replace school? Absolutely. Play. We never lose our ability to play. 
you look at these 15 year olds wanting to build <laughs> a crater all the way to China. <laughs> you know, play is something we always need to do and we learn from it. Our play changes, definitely around age 13, play changes from Play-Doh and painting and Lego to screen play. I've noticed that a lot more on my kids, but um, still everybody needs an opportunity to play. So yes, I, this is my favorite poem. I tried to teach my child with words. They often passed them by unheard. I tried to teach my child with books. He only gave me puzzled looks. Despairingly, I turned aside. How can I teach this child? I cried. Into my hand, he placed the key. Come, he said, and play with me. <laughs> and that's by Anonymous. Don't know who wrote that, but anyways, um, yeah, so this is the end of our webinar for tonight. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, I'm offering the unschooling book for um, $30 if you want to e transfer me and send me your address. I will ship it out. I don't have to pay Amazon, so I'd be happy to forward a signed copy to you. And this is forever. You, there's no time limit. So whenever you want. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And um, next month's webinar is going to be, actually, it's Unschooling 101s. And we're taking a trip. So I probably won't be there on September 18th. Um, however, uh, if you want to know more about Unschooling 101, there is a video on the website unschoolingcanada.ca, which you can watch. And it's, it's pretty well the same video, but we open it up to questions. So, and then we're kind of back in October, but I got to move that date too, because we're still away. <laughs> One of the great things about unschooling is traveling during that grade 12 year. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for joining us. And we will. <clears throat> See you again.